Okay, let's start our lecture. Last lecture, we learned some properties of uh, continuous time Fourier transform. And the last property we learned is uh, convolution, which means if we have two signals uh, convolution in the time domain, then it's Fourier transform is just the point-wide uh, multiplication uh, in the frequency domain. And this property is useful when uh, calculating the response of an LTI system to a continuous time signal X of T. So given the LTI system, given its unit impulse response, last chapter we learned that if input X of T is a periodic signal, then we can calculate its Fourier series. And then we can calculate the output signal Y of T, which is also periodic and has the same format of linear combination as the Fourier series of X of T, except that there is this capital H we learned how to calculate last chapter. Method two we learned even further before is to calculate the continuous time convolution between X and H, but depending on the structures of these two signals, the calculation can be sometimes sophisticated. Then method three, which is both a uh, generalizable uh, to the uh, periodic or non-periodic signal X of T and also uh, much easier to calculate than the convolution. Uh, it utilizes this convolution property of Fourier series, of Fourier transform. Uh, first, we calculate the Fourier transform of both input X and the unit impulse response H. Just multiply these two Fourier transforms and this is the Fourier transform capital Y uh, of the output of this system. Then the output signal Y of T is just the inverse Fourier transform. So the, given the same LTI system, we can represent its response in time domain and frequency domain, uh, they are equivalent. So in time domain, the output is the convolution between X and H. In frequency domain, the output is just input multiplies the uh, capital H, which is called the frequency response of the LTI system. And this lecture, let's continue looking at uh, this tool for calculating LTI system response. Uh, in particular, we look at a LTI system that can be described by this differential equation. So it says the following, uh, y and uh, X and Y are the input and output of this LTI system in time domain. And here this dkx dtk means the kth order derivative of X over time t. For example, if k equals one is just the dx dt, the regular differentiation. If k equals two is the second order derivative. And for each kth order derivative, multiply it by a constant coefficient d of k on the right hand side, we add up those uh, uh, different orders of differentiations of x uh, from k uh, equals zero to m. So up to the capital M order derivative. On the left, we do the same operation for the output y of t. And uh, on the left, we have uh, up to nth order derivative. For an LTI system described by these differential equations, a question is how to determine its frequency response, capital H, and its unit impulse response, small h. So the relationship between capital H and small h is that they are uh, mutually the Fourier and inverse Fourier transforms. Okay. And to answer this question, we apply the property we learned before, which is the uh, Fourier transform for differentiation, uh, for kth order differentiation. If we are looking at a signal uh, dkx dtk, then its Fourier transform is uh, capital X, the Fourier transform of X, multiplies j omega to the power k. Uh, this is what we learned before. Uh, applying this property to the differential equation above, so every dky dtk, its Fourier transform is j omega to the power k, capital Y. On the right hand side, uh, same lay up uh, with X. And from both, from the left hand side, we can extract a common factor, capital Y of J omega. 
And from the right hand side, we extract common factor capital X and divide capital X to the left hand side, divide the coefficient before capital Y to the right hand side so that the capital Y divided capital X is a uh, is the ratio between two polynomials of J omega right? on the numerator is an M order uh, polynomial on the uh, denominator is an nth order polynomial. And this polynomial of J omega, which is a fu function of omega, J omega, it is capital H with J omega because of this because of this relationship. So Y is capital X times capital H. So capital H is the, the is the is Y divided by X. And H of T, the time domain unit impulse response is the inverse Fourier transform of capital H. So here by putting the uh, polynomial of A case, J omega case on the denominator we assume that either the denominator is non-zero or if it is zero, then the uh, as omega goes to zero, the, li the limitation of the ratio exists. So for example, if we have a non-zero, a zero, a non-zero coefficient a zero, then the denominator is a non-zero. I mean, uh, well, no, no, that's not right. So if we have an omega, say some omega star, when omega approaches omega star, then the denominator approaches zero. Then we assume that when omega approaches omega star, the numerator also approaches zero. And if we apply the L'Hopital's rule, then taking the derivative of both denominator and numerator, when omega goes to omega, omega star, the limit exists. So the, there is a underlying assumption which I didn't put on the slide, but uh, overall it is okay to write the polynomial in this way. Now let's look at the example. Uh, applying the Fourier transform to LTI system. Given the LTI system, uh, we know that if its input is exponential minus two T U T, then the corresponding output is this signal. So it's exponential minus t minus exponential minus three t u of t. The first question is, what is the fr uh, frequency response capital H of this LTI system? So again, capital H is capital Y divided by capital X. And first we need to calculate the Fourier transform of, uh, of capital uh, of, of X and the Y, the input and output. Uh, Okay, for this first example, let's just look at uh, the answer together. Uh, to calculate the Fourier transform of uh, y divided by uh, y and x, uh, we apply the previous result here. This previous result says for some constant a larger than zero, the signal exponential minus a t u of t is Fourier transform is one minus one divided by a plus j omega. Then we just apply this property to y and x. For y, it has two terms. The first term applying this property when a equals one is one over one plus j omega. The second term, a equals three, so it's one over three plus j omega. On the denominator, applying this property to exponential minus two t u of t it is one divided by two plus j omega. Now we can simplify it by flipping the two plus j omega on the numerator, two plus j omega, two, uh, one plus j omega, and then put the one plus j omega, three plus j omega on the denominator. So that for the first term, we need to multiply an additional three plus j omega on the numerator. For the second term, we need to apply additional one plus j omega on the numerator. Uh, simplifying the numerator a little bit when we merge the terms, the common terms, and we have four plus two J omega on the numerator and the same for the denominator. So this is, this polynomial of J omega is H of J omega. And the second question, 
what is the unit impulse response small h of t for the LTI system? Last question, we already determined the capital H, and we know that small h is the inverse Fourier transform of capital H. But here again, we can apply this property we obtained previously. But to apply this property, we need to first split capital H in a way that has some one minus that it is written as the combination of one minus a plus j omega for some a larger than zero. So I will leave this for your practice uh, two minutes and then we look at how to do it. Right. A more explicit hint is to split capital H as something divided by one plus J omega uh, plus something divided by three plus J omega. And then we can apply this property. Okay, let's look at how to solve a problem like this. So, as I said, what we want is to split capital H as something divided by one plus J omega plus something divided by three plus J omega. But we don't know the coefficients for each of these two terms. We denote them by A and B respectively. And the next we want to solve for A and B. So starting from this step, uh, we can try to uh, derive it back to the original form so that we have one plus j omega multiplies three plus j omega on the denominator. Then on the numerator, with a, we multiply three plus j omega. With b, we multiply one plus j omega. So to keep this uh, equality whole. And then we put the constant terms three a and b together. We put the coefficients before j omega, so a and b together, so a plus b j omega. And because of this equality, this numerator needs to be the same with the original numerator four plus two j omega. This gives us a two, e, two equations with two unknowns. So three a plus b equals four, a plus b equals two. And solving these set of equations, we can obtain both a and b equal to one. Therefore, if we want to split capital H, it must be split as one divided by one plus j omega plus one divided by three plus j omega. So this technique is called the partial fraction expansion as it's commonly used later, uh, not only in Fourier transform, but also in uh, plus and Z transforms uh, when you want to calculate the frequency response of uh, LTI system. 
Now, after converting capital H in this way, then we, if we want to calculate small h, the unit impulse response of the system, it's much easier because we can apply this previous result for the first term, just the case A equals one. So the time domain signal is exponential minus one T U of T. And the second term A equals three because it's three plus J omega. So it's for inverse Fourier transform is exponential minus three T U of T, right? Just extract common vector factor U of T. What's left is exponential minus T plus exponential minus three T. But this signal of T is the unit impulse response H of T. Okay. okay. So after calculating the frequency response capital H and the unit impulse response small h, the next step is the next question is what is the differential equation representation for this LTI system? So we learned that if we are given a differential equation representation for the relationship between input and output, then we can derive its frequency response capital H. But this question is asking what is the differential equation? So we can do it by reversing these steps uh, because a capital H is already given just to try to write it as this form of polynomial and then through inverse Fourier transform get the differential equation. So let's have one minute to do this. Okay, let's look at the answer. Uh, we already know that capital H, which is capital Y divided by capital X is this uh, polynomial, is this uh, fraction polynomial above. And for the denominator, uh, we want to have a standard form of polynomial in, uh, written in second order, first order, the zero order terms. Uh, so the second order term j omega square, first order term three plus one is four j omega, zeroth order, the constant term is one times three, which is three. And then we multiply the denominator with the numerator of the left-hand side. We get a polynomial multiplies capital Y on the left-hand side. Multiply capital X with the numerator on the right-hand side, we get a polynomial multiplies capital X. And applying this property uh, in the blue box. So it says, if we have signal, we have a Fourier transform capital X multiplies J omega to the power K, then it's the inverse Fourier transform is DX K, uh, DKX DT. Then applying this to each individual terms. So see the first term is just the D square Y DT square. The second term DY DT multiplies constant four. Third term, the inverse Fourier transform of capital Y is just a small y of t with the coefficient three. The same for the right hand side, so two dx dt four x. This is a differential equation describing the relationship between input x and output y of this LTI system. So till now, we are done with the uh, properties and responses of this particular LTI system. To consolidate 
our knowledge uh, on this topic, let's look at another example. So for this example, what's different is that we are given the differential equation at the beginning. So the input X and output Y, the relationship is described by this differential equation. Then the first question is how to obtain capital H from this differential equation. Uh, we can apply these steps we learned above in the, uh, so now in the, in the uh, right order, not the reverse order. Okay, let's have one minute for this. Okay. So I believe many of you already know how to do this. Uh, because we can apply the Fourier transform to this uh, differential equation, right? So for example, for the first term, d square y dt square is just the j omega square times capital Y. Similarly for the rest of the terms, then we can easily calculate capital Y divided by capital X. So what is left on the numerator, just the coefficient on the right-hand side. What's left on the uh, denominator is the polynomial on the left-hand side after removing capital Y. This polynomial, this fraction of a polynomial is capital H. The second question, determine the unit impulse response small h of t for this LTI system. So again, so this the same same procedure on the last exercise. Uh, we can first split capital H so that we can uh, apply this property uh, using the uh, fraction or partial fractional uh, expansion. So let's have uh, two minutes for this. Right, uh, you need to first factorize the denominator. Which means first I write denominator as some a plus j omega times another a plus j omega. So in that form.
Okay. So first, H is written in this form here from the last question. We first need to write factorize the denominator so that it's written as j omega plus two times j omega plus four. Now you can check it. So we have j omega square, no problem. Two plus four, which is six j omega, no problem. Two times four, which is eight, no problem. And next we split as two terms. The first term with denominator j omega plus two, the second term with j omega plus four, and the coefficients are respectively capital A and capital B. Uh, to apply the partial fraction expansion, we want to uh, write it, write this split form back to the original form where we have a combined uh, multiplied factors. And uh, for that, to make the equivalence hold, uh, we have A times J omega plus four plus B times J omega plus two. And then combine the coefficient for J omega, which is A plus B, combine the constant coefficients, which is four, uh, the, co the constant term, four A and two B, right? Four A, two B from here, so four A plus two B. And then make the coefficients are respectively equal to the original coefficient. In the original capital H, there is no first order term. There is no J omega term. Therefore, A plus B must equal zero so that this first term just eliminate. And then the second term for a plus two b, the constant is two. And solving this, uh, this set of equations with two unknowns, we can get a and b, which is one and one is minus one respectively. Therefore, h of j omega after the split, it is one divided by j omega plus two minus one divided by j omega plus four. Then applying this result previous from previous exercise, we can obtain small h uh, as the inverse Fourier transform of capital H. The first term a equals two, so it's exponential minus two t u of t. Second term a equals four, so exponential minus four t u of t. There's minus sign in the, between these two terms. And this function of t is h of t. And we are done with this question. Next question. Now we are given an input signal x of t, which is exponential minus two t u of t. So how to determine the corresponding output signal y of t? So here we already know the differential equation describing the relationship between x and y. So of course we can solve the differential equation directly because x of t is given uh, there is some way to calculate y of t. But the solving differential equation uh, straightforwardly might be uh, complicated. Since we learned Fourier transform, uh, we want to use Fourier transform to determine y of t. So, the, so this is what we learned, right? We have input, we take its Fourier transform as capital H, X. We already know capital H, which is the Fourier transform of small h. Then the Fourier transform of output, capital Y, just X times H. Then we can obtain small y using the inverse Fourier transform. So since we are given X of T here, applying this property, we can get its Fourier transform capital X. So let's start from here. And uh, I'll give you two minutes, try to calculate small y by yourself.
OK. So very long uh, procedure, but let's look at it step by step. The first step, since we are given small x of t, is Fourier transform applying this uh, result is just one divided by two plus j omega. The second step, we calculate capital Y, which is capital X times capital H. Capital X just calculated capital H. So we obtained from a previous result uh, this is uh, with its uh, denominator factorized. And therefore on the denominator, we have j omega plus two square times j omega plus four. Again, we want to apply the partial fraction expansion to the split to this, uh, to this capital Y. But since it has a square term, then we need to split as three terms. One is uh, a divided by j omega plus two. So the, with this corresponding to this j omega plus two, there is a first order term. And since it's a, it has square here, then there is also a square term, so j omega plus two square on the denominator with coefficient b, and then another term with j omega plus four on the denominator. So now we want to convert this split of fractions to, to the original form of capital Y. Right? So j omega plus two square, j omega plus four. So when merging the numerator, one thing to pay attention is that, so for A, since originally it has j omega plus two to the first order, I mean, to the power one on the denominator. So now it has power two. So it has to multiply additional j omega plus two to make the equality whole. And then j omega plus four. For the coefficient b, so j omega plus two square is already on the denominator. So we only need to multiply the j omega plus four, the additional factor. For c, j omega plus four is already on the denominator. So we only need to apply additional factor, which is j omega plus two square. Right? Because this is square, this is square. And then for A and C, we need to expand the, the, uh, the twice order uh, not polynomials. So j omega square, two plus four is six j omega, two times four is eight as the constant term. For C, j omega square, four j omega plus four. Just expand the complete square. And we combine the coefficients for j omega square, which has A and C. There's no j omega square for B. So that's only A plus C. For j omega, it has six A, right? six times A. It has B, just one B. That's four times C, four times C. For the constant term, it has a times a, four times b, four times c. And we want to make this entire expression equal to the original capital Y, which is copied down from here. The denominator are the same, so don't care about it. The numerator, numerator we want to make them the same so that the coefficient for j omega square and for j omega are both zero because there is no j omega square and j omega terms in the numerator. There is only a constant term two in the numerator which must equal 8a plus 4b plus 4c. So we solve this set of three equations with three unknowns, but there is a unique solution. I will learn how to solve it from our linear algebra class. You can use matrix, you can, uh, you can cancel or eliminate variables using two equations first, and then uh, get a, a set of two equations, two variables. So it's a different methods to solve for it. But the result is A equals minus one half, B equals one, C equals one half. And we can quickly check A plus C is zero, six A plus B plus four C. Well, you can check it later by yourself. It is correct. So the capital Y, is the 
combination of these three terms with their uh, respective coefficients minus one half, one, one half. Applying the inverse Fourier transform. So the first term we can apply the result on the right top corner. So with A equals two, it's just exponential minus two T U of T with coefficient minus one half. The third term A equals four, so exponential minus four T U of T with coefficient one half. For the term in the middle, where it has one divided by J omega plus two square. So we also learned it from a previous example. So this property, I remember it's from slide number uh, 57, you can check it later. So the exponential minus a t u of t, if we multiply it with additional time t, then its Fourier transform is one divided by a plus j omega square. Actually, we had a more general result, which says t to the power n minus one divided by n minus one factorial is Fourier transform is one divided by a plus j omega to the power n. But anyway, in this exercise is sufficient to apply the case uh, to the power two. So for this to the power two on the denominator, a equals two. So it's t times exponential minus two t u of t. Uh, these three terms are added together. This function of t is the signal, output signal y of t of this RTI system. Uh, one question from the chat window is, is there a direct inverse Fourier transform formula for this kind of uh, polynomial? Well, uh, I mean, in general, the uh, Fourier transform formula for this uh, fraction of polynomial is hard to memorize. So in the problems you are to solve, uh, I recommend you to just use the partial fraction expansion to split it and then apply these results that are relatively easier to memorize. Okay, so after finishing this example, we also finish this chapter. This chapter, we learned continuous time Fourier transform in two weeks. In the first week, we learned the definition how to, why we need continuous time Fourier transform that's to apply it to non-periodic continuous time signals. How to obtain it? We have standard equations to calculate by calculating some uh, integral. And we look at the relationship between continuous time Fourier transform and the Fourier series. But simply speaking, if we are given a continuous time periodic signal, then it has both Fourier series and the Fourier transform. The difference is that Fourier series is a representation still in time domain, a Fourier transform transforms the signal to the frequency domain. But there's some relationship, some connection between uh, these two different representations. There are some common factors, AK, in both uh, Fourier transform and Fourier series for periodic signals. And then we learn some properties which can be used to obtain continuous time Fourier transform more conveniently after the time domain operation of some signal, right? Time reflection, scaling, uh, time, uh, time shifting. And also if we have two signals convolution in the time domain, in the frequency domain, it's just the multiplication of the Fourier transforms. And this last property is useful when applying to the LTI system. Given input to LTI system, we can determine its output more conveniently in the frequency domain and then apply the inverse Fourier transform to get the time domain output. So we apply this uh, tool with a particular kind of LTI system whose input output relationship can be described by differential equations. Uh, let's have a break and come back at 12.30 to start a new chapter, the discrete time Fourier transform. So that chapter will be shorter than continuous time Fourier transform because you will find a lot of analogies between them. Okay. <laughs> Everyone okay? <laughs> I hope so. Uh,
Okay, let's resume the lecture, start the new chapter, discrete time Fourier transform. So before that, let's quickly recap the continuous time Fourier transform we learned last chapter, uh, these two equations. The first one is the Fourier transform, which by the integral converts x of t to capital X of j omega. And the second equation, the inverse Fourier transform, uh, the, through the integral, on the continuous frequency variable omega converted back to x of t. So we can write, uh, denote this uh, Fourier inverse Fourier transform using calibre f. And then the main application of continuous time Fourier transform is to a continuous time LTI system. So as we just learned, we can conveniently get the frequency response by taking by uh, the multiplication of capital X and capital H after the Fourier transform. And this continuous time Fourier transform can be extended to discrete time signal X of N. This chapter, we will learn what is discrete time Fourier transform, how to obtain it, and there are a set of properties similar to the continuous time case to obtain a discrete time Fourier transform after some time domain uh, transformation. And then its application to discrete time LTI system to obtain the system response. So I will just uh, introduce the definition of uh, the formula to calculate discrete time Fourier transform by exploiting its analogy to the continuous time case. So this is the continuous time. We come to the discrete time first. X of t, we need to change it to x of n. n is the discrete time index. j omega t, change it to minus j omega n. And because the n is discrete time, var, uh, time index, so there's, we cannot take integral. Instead, we have an infinite sum, uh, n from minus infinity to plus infinity. So the right-hand side completely follows analogy with the continuous time case. And one thing to notice that although the time index n is discrete, they are only the integers, but the frequency omega, even in the discrete time Fourier transform is still a continuous, a continu continuous frequency. And to differentiate the discrete time and the continuous time case on the left hand side, we use a different notation from the continuous time. A continuous time is capital X of j omega, uh, because we can, so j is just a, con a, a constant. It's the imaginary operator. So at the end of the day, the right-hand side is the signal of omega. So we put j omega together, as I said, it was a convention. But for discrete time, because exponential j omega can also be treated as an argument in this function, right? So exponential minus j omega n is just a, exponential j omega then to the power minus n. So we can put exponential j omega together as a argument to this function of capital X. But both the, the left-hand side above and the below, they are functions of omega, but we just denote them in different conventions. So X of j omega for continuous time Fourier transform X of exponential j omega for discrete time Fourier transform to better differentiate. Yes, the graph is continuous on omega. So let's look at an example. We have a discrete time signal X of n. So you can see X of n only have val has values defined on integers n. But after the discrete time Fourier transform, it is a continuous signal on frequency omega. So omega is a continuous frequency, even for discrete time Fourier transform. And in particular, it is a continuous periodic signal. The fundamental period is two pi. As we can see from this figure, the pattern repeats zero, two pi, minus two pi. So the period is two pi. And why two pi? Because for this signal, x of exponential j omega, if you consider omega plus two pi, then substitute it on the right-hand side, 
we change the omega on the right hand side with omega plus two pi. And because for this exponential, exponential minus j omega plus two pi n, we know that it is, if we plot it on the complex plane, it's modulus or its magnitude is one. Its angle is minus omega plus two pi n. In particular, this two pi n means we rotate the vector representing this complex number by two pi n reading. In other words, by n full cycles. So by turning it by n two full cycles, the vector will return to the original location. So exponential minus j omega plus two pi n is the same complex number with exponential minus j two j omega n. So I can change the last term just to exponential minus j omega n, which gives us the original x of j omega, x of uh, exponential j omega. Therefore, from the beginning and end, we can see that the capital X is a signal with period two pi. Actually, you can show this is also the fundamental period, which I skip here. Now we have the uh, discrete time Fourier transform introduced. We also have discrete time inverse Fourier transform. Uh, we can also compare it with the continuous time case. For well, the continuous time, the inverse Fourier transform is this capital X times exponential J omega T integration over frequency omega. And because omega for the discrete time Fourier transform is also continuous. We can also take its uh, integral x of exponential j omega, which is the Fourier transform, exponential j omega n. So we change t to n when we change from continuous time to discrete time, the omega. And the difference is that the integral is not taken over minus infinity to plus infinity, but we have two pi here, which means the integral is taken over any interval whose length is two pi. Because for capital X of exponential j omega is periodic with fundamental period two pi. If we multiply exponential j omega n, it's also periodic with period two pi because exponential j omega n itself, if we change omega by two pi, this complex number does not change. So for this periodic signal, with period two pi, its integral is the same over any interval whose length is the fundamental period. In other words, whose length is two pi. Therefore, we can just take any interval whose length is two pi to take the integral. But this is a difference between continuous time and discrete time inverse Fourier transform. Uh, well, there is detailed reason why it is not minus infinity to plus infinity, but it's is interval just with less two pi. Uh, you can find it on the textbook. I recommend you read chapter five of uh, Oppenheim and Wilski. Uh, but I will not put the detailed explanation here because I believe it's beyond the scope of this chapter that we need to learn. Okay, so the Fourier inverse Fourier transform for discrete time signal X of N, put it in the blue box. Uh, we use the same notation, caliber F, uh, to denote Fourier transform. So F inverse is the inverse Fourier transform. Always sometimes just put F on the arrow. This is the same with the continuous time case. Again, let me emphasize the signal on the left hand side is discrete time domain. Signal on the right hand side is in continuous frequency domain. Now let's look at the uh, an example. So someone asked a question, but the integral becomes discrete, uh, not necessarily. Uh, even for discrete time, the integral, uh, after integral, you will find it is a continuous and smooth function over the frequency omega. Uh, so let's look at this example. We have discrete time signal x of n, which is a n times a to the power n times u n. So A is some 
complex number in general, but its magnitude is less than one. Here, I just show a particular example where A is a real number, one over two. Its magnitude is also its absolute value less than one. Then A to the power N, if you look at the part N larger than zero, it's one. So one over two to the power zero equals one. One over two to the power one is one over two. One over two to the power two is one over four. So it's, we have a decaying series over when n increases to positive infinity. And because it multiplies this u of n, which is the unit step signal, remember that u of n is one when n larger than equal to zero. So it keeps everything unchanged for n larger than equal to zero. It's still this decaying sequence. But for n less than zero, u of n equals zero. So multiplying a to the power n eliminates everything to zero. To the left of the uh, n equals zero, it's everything is zero. So this is an illustration of signal x of n. For this signal, how to calculate its Fourier transform? I give you the standard formula here. Just use this formula, try to do it yourself. I'll give you two minutes. One hint is to apply the formula for calculating the summation of a series with common ratio. We learned this formula in chapter one and they use it multiple times during the learning procedure. Okay, let's look at how to calculate in uh, discrete time Fourier transform. Apply the standard formula, it says an infinite sum over index n, x of n exponential minus j omega n. So don't forget this minus sign. The x of n, a to the power n, u of n, but here I can remove u n, but at the same time, I need to uh, keep the, uh, only keep the positive, the non-negative, summation index, because for every n that's negative, the term is, the associated term is just a zero. So we discard them, only keep n from zero to plus infinity. And for this, I mean, some will reorganize it a little bit. So a times exponential minus j omega n, then to the power n. So because the, magnitude of A is less than one, then if you consider A times the exponential minus J omega, this, the magnitude of this number equals the magnitude of A, which is also less than one, Let's show it here. Because exponential minus J omega just have a, a unity, uh, it's just a, a unit uh, magnitude. And let's consider this A times exponential minus J omega as uh, some number beta. So for beta whose magnitude less than one, if we have this series from beta to the power n one, 
add up to beta to the power n2, then we have this uh, formula to calculate the summation. On the denominator, one minus beta. On the numerator, it's the first term minus the last term, where the last term uh, multiply with additional common factor beta. And when I apply this formula to our case, on the denominator, one minus a times exponential minus j omega because a times exponential minus j omega is our beta in that formula. On the, on the numerator, the first term, just when n equals zero. And the last term, the last term n goes to infinity. So when n2 goes to infinity, because beta magnitude less than one, beta to the power n2 plus one, we just diminish, so diminish to zero. So the second term just disappear. So we just have the first term. And uh, something to the power zero is one. So the numerator just one, denominator this thing. So after using the standard formula, what we have is a, a continuous signal of omega because A is something given, right? It's a constant less than one. Because it's less than one, so the denominator cannot be, can never be zero. We can put it on the denominator. And the only variable is omega, the frequency. I denote it by capital X of J omega is the Fourier transform of X. Okay. Now let's look at a little bit harder example. A to the power N absolute value. Again, constant A is magnitude less than one, but how to understand this absolute value on the exponent? So for N larger than or equal to zero, N absolute value just equals N. So it's A to the power N, the same as the last example, a sequence that decays when N increases. But when N is less than zero, because the N absolute value is a signal that's symmetric, over n equals zero. So a to the power n absolute value is also symmetric with respect to n equals zero, or it's symmetric with respect to the horizontal axis. By such a signal, we call it an even signal. So it's, we can see from this example, the symmetry. For this signal, how to calculate its Fourier transform. Again, we use the standard formula. Uh, let's have two minutes for practice.
Okay, so how to solve this problem? Again, we apply the standard formula, uh, replace x of n with n a to the power n absolute value. We need to discuss whether n is non-negative or negative. When n is negative, the absolute value of n is minus n, right? n is negative number minus n is positive number. It's the absolute value. So a to the power minus n, exponential minus j omega n. That's for all the n which is negative. So the summation is for all the n that's negative. For the rest of n which are non-negative, so from zero to plus infinity, n absolute value is just n itself. So a to the power n. For the first term for convenience, we substitute minus n with a new integer index m. So we change minus n to m, change minus n to m, so it becomes exponential j omega m. And also m equals minus n. So when n is minus infinity, m is plus infinity. When n is minus one, m is plus one. So this is the first term. The second term, we can just apply the result of last example. Because if you look at this summation, it's the same as the summation in the last example, which I already calculated here. One divided by one minus a exponential minus j omega. So one divided by one minus a exponential minus j omega. And to calculate the first term, it's again a summation with common ratio a times exponential j omega because a magnitude less than one, so a times exponential j omega is magnitude also less than one. So we can apply this formula. Again, on the denominator is one minus the common ratio. On the numerator is the first term minus zero because as m goes to infinity, the last term just uh, diminishes to zero. Second term follows from the last step. So we have this as our result. If you are interested, you can simplify a little bit. Note that the two denominators are not the same. The first one has exponential plus j omega. Second one has exponential minus j omega. So we multiply these two different denominators. For the first numerator, we multiply it with the additional one minus a exponential minus j omega. For the second term, we multiply additional one minus a exponential j omega. So we can simplify the numerator and the denominator respectively. For the numerator, so after, after uh, expanding this factor, it has four terms. The first term is a exponential j omega, the last term minus a exponential j omega. So the first and last term just cancel each other. What is left is the second, third term. Third term is one is here, second term a square, Exponential j omega, exponential minus j omega, they just cancel, so just a square, minus a square. For the denominator, right, you can expand the uh, polynomial, so one, one times one is one. The third and the, the second, third term, we have a exponential j omega plus, so we have a minus sign first, and then what is left is a times exponential j omega plus exponential minus j omega. Applying the uh, corollary of Euler's formula. So exponential j omega plus exponential minus j omega is two times cosine omega. So two a cosine omega. And the last term plus, right? Minus minus becomes plus, plus a square. And the exponentials just cancel each other. So this is a, simpler form because there's no imaginary operator j, there's only omega. Uh, but as a convention, we still write it as x of exponential j omega. So remember, it's just a function of variable omega. So this notation is just a uh, convention. Doesn't mean on the result, it must have a exponential j omega. And this simplification in your homework and uh, exams, it's not necessary. Uh, just uh, if you can do, you can come to this step, it's already okay. But, but this simplification is just for a conciser result. Okay. Now we have time, let's look at some properties of discrete time Fourier transform. So for this chapter, we are going 
a lot faster than the continuous time because we had experience before. Again, we have two discrete time signals, X and Y, is Fourier transform are respectively X, capital X and capital Y. If I have a new discrete time signal, A plus Xn plus B, uh, A times Xn plus B times Yn, so that is for every time N, for this new signal, its Fourier transform is just the yeah, same as the continuous time case, the same linear combination, A capital X plus B capital Y. So this is the linearity property, which I believe is not hard to understand. Time shifting property, we have a signal X whose Fourier transform is capital X. Then if we shift X by a integer N0, so N0 can be negative or positive. When it's positive, we are shifting it to the right. When it's negative, we are shifting it to the left. But regardless of the direction, as long as it's in the form N minus N0, then its Fourier transform is just the original Fourier transform capital X times exponential minus J omega N0. So in the continuous time, it is exponential minus j omega t0, where t0 is the shift amount. So we change t0 to n0, the same structure still holds. And this time shifting property can be applied to uh, calculating discrete time impulse that occurs at any location n0. So the standard discrete time impulse, unit impulse, is just zero everywhere with an one that occurs at n equals zero, that denoted by delta of n. Then delta of n minus n zero, just the same shape, but the impulse occurs at n zero. Here I didn't specify whether n zero is larger than zero or less than zero. So it can be either case, but as long as the impulse occurs at n zero, the expression is delta of n min minus n zero. Then, uh, I will give you as a practice in two minutes. First, I calculate the Fourier transform of delta n using the standard formula in the box above, and then try to quickly obtain the Fourier transform of delta n minus n zero using the time shift property. Right, someone already got the result. So let's just look at standard formula, uh, delta of n here, exponential minus j omega n, infinite sum. But notice the structure of delta of n is zero everywhere, just except for one term. So the infinite sum finally becomes a finite sum with only one term. That is delta of zero equals one, exponential minus omega, minus j omega zero, which is one the result is one. So if you look at the result, it's a continuous function, continuous signal over frequency omega, but it's a constant value one. If you plot it over the omega axis, so the horizontal axis is omega, it's a constant one that does not change. So this is the shape of the Fourier transform for delta of n, which is again, the same as the continuous time case. Yeah, all the frequencies exist with the same magnitude. If we apply the time shift property, delta n minus n zero is Fourier transform is just the result above times exponential minus j omega n zero. The result above is one, so the Fourier transform of delta n minus n zero is exponential minus j omega n zero. N zero is a given amount. We already know how much is shift. Then again, the result is only a function of omega, a variable omega. And we can check it by using the standard formula. The standard formula just tells us the signal delta n minus n zero multiplies this exponential 
take the infinite sum. But again, because this delta is zero everywhere except for one term at n zero, then the infinite sum becomes the single term with delta equals one exponential minus j omega n, n equals n zero. So the two methods lead to the same result. We are doing the right thing. Another property is the uh, time expansion. It's a little bit hard, uh, but uh, mm, for this, I will not give an example. I don't think there is any homework or exes, uh, exam problems associated with it, just for your interest to understand. So X of N is discrete time signal is for your transform is capital X. Now we expand x of n in the time domain. Say if we expand it by k times, and denote the signal after expansion by x k of n. The example is when k equals two, x two of n, if we plot it, we can see that originally there are five samples around the vertical axis with the value one. And after expansion, those five samples are further from each other. Originally, they are consecutive next to each other. Now after expansion, they, their distance, their mutual distance is two. There's one additional sample in between. And since we are expanding it in discrete time, we need to fill some value for the, uh, for the signal in between. Originally, the value in between is not defined. And after expansion, we just fill zero at these locations. And write the expression. If n divided by k is an integer, so in our case, when k equals two, when n equals zero, n equals two, n equals four, n equals six, and so on, n divided by two is an integer. Then it's expression just x of n divided by k, right? You can connect it with the continuous time case. We know that when continuous time, we have x of t divided by k. It's expanding that signal by k times. And for discrete time, for the first case, the same expression just change t to n. But for the second case, when n divided by k is not an integer, for example, when n equals one, one divided by two is a fraction, it's not an integer. Or when equals three, three divided by two is also, is not an integer either. For these cases, the x of n divided by k is not defined because if you want to look at x of one over two from the original signal, x of one over two is not defined because x is only defined for x of an integer. Then for this kind of, samples with just a few zero. Okay. And for such kind of expansion, so from X to X K of N, the Fourier transform is capital X exponential J K omega. Originally it's exponential J omega. We are just changing from omega to K omega. So although we are expanding the signal in time domain, but in frequency domain, we are compressing that signal. Right, from omega to k omega, we are compressing it on the omega axis. So intuitively it shows the following. Original signal we have, it has this shape. The first peak at zero, second peak at pi, third peak at two pi. But after the time domain expansion, its Fourier transform is the first peak is still at zero, second peak at pi divided by two, third peak at pi. So we are compressing it to one half over the omega axis. So remember this relationship when it's expanding on the time domain, its frequency domain is compressing. And the same for the case when k equals three. When k equals three, we are expanding the time domain signal by three times. So it means originally there are these uh, samples have distance one, they are next to each other, but now they have distance three with each other. And in between there are two samples, we need to fill values zero. The same expression, right? 
when n divided by three is not integer, say n equals one equals two. So we have one over three, two over three respectively who are not integers. Then we refer to the second case where we fill zero. When n divided by three is integer, n equals zero, n equals three, n equals six and so on. Then we just fill x of n divided by three. So, which means here it is. The new signal n equals zero is still x of zero. The new signal when n equals three, it corresponds to x of one. The new signal x of six, it corresponds to x of two. Sorry, the new signal n equals six, it corresponds to x of two. Always divide the index by three. But anyway, after this time domain expansion and feeding appropriate zeros, is Fourier transform is still the expression, the, the, the uh, compression of original Fourier transform by k times. So this example is three times. Originally, the second peak appears at pi. This time appears at pi divided by three. So compression by three times. And two pi, now it's compressed to two pi divided by three, so two over three pi. And originally there is a peak, peak at three pi, there is a lower peak at three pi. Then after expansion, the lower peak occurs at three pi divided by three, which is pi. This is the time expansion. Next relationship is passive hours relation. We learned Passivall's relation for the continuous time version, which says the continuous time integral over t equals the continuous frequency integral over omega divided by one or two pi. And when we come to discrete time, the continuous time integral becomes continuous time summation because time index n are integers. Again, we need to take the magnitude of x of n, because x of n can be any complex number, magnitude. Or if it's a real number, it's just absolute value. Magnitude square, we take the infinite sum, it equals the Fourier transform magnitude square, taking integral over frequency, but this time, so it corresponds to the inverse Fourier transform. The integral is not taken over minus infinity to plus infinity. It's taken over any interval whose length is two pi. So this two pi is the same as the two pi in the inverse Fourier transform. This is a difference from the continuous time case. So two pi here. And the intuition is still the total energy of a signal calculated on the time domain, which is on the left hand side, equals the energy calculated on the frequency domain, which is the integral on the right hand side. This is the passive hours relationship. Uh, the next relationship is convolution, uh, which says, again, very similar to continuous time. We have two signals this time, x of n, h of n. Their Fourier transforms are respectively capital X and the capital H. Then if we have a new signal over time n, which is convolution of x and h. So after convolution, it's still a signal in the time domain n. Then it's a Fourier transform is capital X times capital H. Both capital X and capital H are continuous signals of omega. Then their multiplication is still a continuous signal, omega. Okay. And this property is useful in deciding the output of a discrete time LTI system. Uh, for this, I will introduce in detail on the Friday lecture. Uh, today, let's have an early release. Uh, see you on Friday. Thank you.